God, once again, we thank you for everything you have given us in this life. We thank you for the blessing of being known by you, being chosen by you, and being loved by you. Lord, you've told us that you know every hair of our head. And yet some, so many times, Lord God, we have fallen short and follow the world rather than following you. And I pray, Lord, that as I speak these words that are about to come from my heart, these meditation, Lord God, these words are about to come from my lips, that they might be pleasing in your sight. And Lord, as I speak them, Lord, that they would go out and with your spirit not return to you empty. But Lord God, that they would bless people. And Lord, return them to you. Help us to be conformed, to be more like you. And Lord, I ask this, for you are a rock and you are a true redeemer. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. I quite conveniently left my, my clicker in my other jacket, quite literally. Um, so I'm uh, being very gracious and letting me borrow theirs. But grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Heavenly Father, and from our eternal Savior, Jesus the Christ. Brothers and sisters, there is a game, which I'm guessing most of you, if not all of you, are familiar with. Uh, you, you all know the game Jenga? Um, we have, if you haven't played it, when we have our events, we actually have a, a, a giant-sized Jenga game that one of you all built. Um, pretty fun. But it's, I like Jenga. Um, I, I got a renewed appreciation for it in college, but the, um, you know, if one of the neat things about it is you have to, well, neat, kind of neat for the one who wins at least, the object is you have to, as you slowly take out those bricks, you're trying to get your other opponent to pull out a brick and the have that tower fall. And, and one of the things you know, I find neat about the game is that as you take the bricks out, the, the tower gets a new additional kind of funky shapes to it. Um, one of the many jobs I career, uh, considered at an early age was architecture, and so I was kind of fascinating looking at those things, the different shapes, how a structure could stand. And yet as we look at the idea of Jenga, the more you take away what was once a strong foundation, the tower will eventually fall if it doesn't have the support that it needs, if it's not built on that firm foundation. And yet, as, as I say that to you this morning, it also should make us want to think about Amos. And Amos, as he talks about Amos, Amos was this man who God pulled out of obscurity to be one of God's prophets. Now, now prior to God's calling Amos, he was, he was a herdsman uh, from a little town called Tekoa, which is this tiny village in the southern part of Israel, which was this little town that nobody really paid attention to. It was roughly some 12 miles south of Jerusalem. Uh, and besides being a herdsman, Scripture tells us that uh, he was also a simple dresser of sycamore trees. If you don't know what that means, it means he basically went to the fruit of the sycamore tree and punctured holes in the fruit to make it ripen quicker. Um, interesting side job to have, in case any of you were looking for an additional job. But Tekoa, now Tekoa, again, it didn't have a lot going on it. It wasn't known for a lot. It was primarily an area that was made up of shepherds doing shepherding type of st things. And it was quite, it was kind of a quite quiet and peaceful life that people had there. But one day, while Amos was out doing his shepherding stuff, God decided to stop by with an offer he couldn't refuse. And God said, hey Amos, I've got a special job for you. It's a special mission, and I think that you'd be great for it. I want to you to go prophesy to my people Israel a bold thing to request of somebody, especially during the time period that Amos was alive. Amos was not the most worshipful people at that time, following a God of, of other nations rather than a God above. And I, I am, as I read this, I imagine Amos hearing God's call and thinking to myself, 
that Amos responds probably with something like this, something, God, you know, I have enough trouble getting the animals to listen to my voice, and you want me to go and talk to people who are following other gods? Isn't there anybody else a little bit more qualified than me than you can send? I'm not a prophet. I'm not even the son of a prophet. And on top of that, Amos hadn't even attended any prophet schools. And yes, that was a thing. But the truth is that God doesn't choose people based on what they think of their qualifications. God chooses us based on what he sees. He sees past what we see to what's true to the people we truly are, to the people we truly can be. And praise be to God that his ways are not our ways. Amen. Now, the first, the first six chapters of the book of Amos, they're pretty much his visions and revelations from God. But then we find ourselves in chapter 7, where we are today, and we hear these words. This is what he showed me. This is Amos speaking. This is what God, he showed me. Behold, the Lord was, the Lord was, <clears throat> the Lord was standing beside a wall, built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. Um, and I, for, I actually had bought a plumb line from Harbor Freight, thinking I would show it off, and then I realized there's no way you're going to see that tiny string if I try and put it up here. And so that's actually what a plumb line would look like. It's a simple string, if you're looking on the screen there, with a, a heavy weight on the end of it that would show you perfectly what up and down was. But as God is saying this to, to uh, Amos, this is the third vision from Yahweh God. Prior to this, back in chapter 4 of Amos, we had heard how God had to try to repair and rebuild his nation of Israel, both physically as well as spiritually, trying to draw them back to them, trying to redirect them away from those foreign gods. God wanted his people to be with him. He wanted them to love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, and mind. Sounds like a commandment we've heard before. But unfortunately, like a lot of Christians today, like a lot of Christians today, they were more about themselves. And so instead of worshiping the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they were worshiping the Trinity of me, myself, and I. There's a saying, I don't know if it's used so much anymore, but it basically says you can put, a li you can put lipstick, all the lipstick you want on a pig, but at the end of the day, it's still a pig. Well, in Amos' day, the northern part of Israel was being ruled by a king by the name of King Jeroboam II. And King Jeroboam, on the surface, he looked like a pretty good king. He had won new territory for Israel. He had been successful in all sorts of battles. He had generated wealth. But in reality, he had so perverted the relationship with God that that relationship didn't look like anything at all, even remotely like what a relationship with God should look like. His wealth, it led to apathy. He allowed foreign gods to come into this, to the nation of Israel to be worshipped, which in turn led to injustice and people ignoring the poor. Again, not the God above, but the God of me, myself, and I. And if we go back to the imagery of Jenga, as you change the design of the tower by moving those blocks around, eventually it's going to fall. Just like you see in some modern day churches. When you worship, when your worship becomes more about you and your ideas about right and wrong than about the God above, that's when the tower begins to fall. You can wear the right wear the quote-unquote right outfits. You can sing wonderful songs. You can have all the smells and bells. But if this tower isn't built on the foundation of God, it's going to fall. And that's why God uses this imagery here of the plumb line. Now, again, I'm no expert car carpenter, but from what I found, plumb lines never fail. It's all a simple weight tied to a string like we have on the, on the slide on the screen today where gravity is the one who decides what's up and down. 
And because of a little, again, again, because of a little thing called gravity, it's always going to show you what is up and down. The ground might not be level, but this tool is never going to be off. Your foundation might look right, and yet if it is off, this is going to show it. And God had chosen this people, Israel. He called them a special nation, a chosen nation, a chosen people. That they would be the ones to show the world how they were to live and to be in a right relationship with God. And to some people, if you were to judge Israel on what Jeroboam II had accomplished, they might have seemed like a great country, a great example to follow. Look, they're successful, they've got wealth, they're, ta they're taking over the land. Look at them, they are powerful judge them on their foundation they might have seemed like they were in good shape but according to God's plumb line they're the only one that matters God's word if this is your plumb line the foundation that they had built for themselves was completely off amen brother you know Paul he talks about that in his, work, in his first letter to the Corinthians, he writes, According to the grace of God given to me, according to his grace, like a, like a skilled master builder, I had laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. According to God's grace, I built that foundation. Let each one take care of how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. What is your foundation? Who are you worshiping? Is it you? Or are you worshiping God? What is your plumb line? Is your plumb line God's word that he gives to us? Or is your plumb line found somewhere else? In the world's ideals, in the world's directions. You know, it's not until sometimes when we hear, we hear things read out loud. I know as I was hearing God's word read and then I read uh, the gospel lesson, I'm reminded of how John the Baptist stood his ground because of his plumb line. Even to the point of death. God's plumb line was the one that he chose to find, follow was the foundation that had been given to him. And quite frankly, as God had called for Amos to go and call and pronounce God's word to him, God had tried for the restoration. In truth, though, the restoration will not occur with a plumb line or with stone walls and plaster, but with God's holy and precious blood and with his innocent sufferings and death. Upon this Christ, the kingdom of God is built. Jesus is the foundation upon which our faith is built. And all other ground is sinking sand. And yet, we are guilty of building the foundations with sand, aren't we? And we sometimes try to use the foundation of our families, of our jobs, of our education, of our wealth. And the sad part is, though, that for many people who claim his name, they like to use these things rather than to first start out with the one true foundation, which is God and his grace. You know, if we read, if we go on to verse 8 of Amos, we hear these words. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. And the Lord said, behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel and I will never again pass them by you know as we hear God say this we're reminded that God has standards God has standards not just for Israel but there has standards for us too and as he tells us there is a plumb line of his word we ask ourselves the question, how do we line up? How do we line up with God and his word? And do we want to line up? You know, I'm 
my chiropractor, one of the things he does is he takes the x-ray and he sees the shape of your spine. And then after he, the, the whole thing is processed, he had a, he's had a challenge or the, or the chance to go and see and, and analyze and come back to me. He showed to me, this is where you are with your spine. This is where you are supposed to be. And he overlays the two. This is what he tries to do is to get, our, get us lined back up again through various things and exercises. And yet, sometimes we don't want to line up with God's word. Let me ask you something. How many of you love the fact that God's grace is enough? Good. Hopefully all your hands are going up, even if some of them are just kind of peeking up there. What, don't, and don't raise your hands for this one. But has God's grace made you forget the fact that he has standards? Let me ask you again. Has God's grace made you forget that he has standards? See, one of the problems with many self-proclaimed Christians is the fact that we focus so much on God's grace that we figure that we can do whatever we want. That we can do whatever we want, and then if that's good enough, because God's grace is going to cover everything. I'm just going to keep on living the life I want. And for those of you who do that, that means that you don't give a hoot or holler about God's plumb line. That blunt, and yet it's true. And this next part is going to sound harsh, but the truth is that if you are thumbing your nose at God and his standards, then you deserve his wrath. God said, here's where I stand. I'd like you to stand here too. Yet for some of us, we said, eh, I'm good. We look at somebody like Herod and say, man, that guy was partying. That guy had a great life. And we hear about John the Baptist. Oh, well, that part I don't like. The partying was great, but uh, let's, let's leave that other part out. And then God shares that story with us to show us about his standards. You know, it's interesting. Some of us find the words of God in Amos as shocking. Why would God want to have wrath on these people? And yet, how must find it shocking that God's people would not want to follow God? How many people call themselves Christians today, and yet they constantly ignore God's plumb line? You know, prior to today's God's reading, from the reading from Amos at the beginning of chapter 7, God had twice pronounced judgment on Israel. And Amos stands up to God He intercedes on the behalf of the people, and yet when we get to this third vision, which is the plumb line, Amos just says, I got nothing. This is the standard. This is the way the people are. We have to admit that people have fallen short of the glory of God. You know, at the end of the day, the truth is that God with his standards, cannot stomach injustice. Israel's neglect of the poor and their alignment with false gods must come to an end, but God will always stay true to his promises. He will always stay true to his commitments. You know, God, we look at Amos, somebody who was a shepherd, called, pulled out of obscurity, and yet there were other shepherds that God pulled out of obscurity. Moses and Mo, he, had, he told Moses that he didn't choose Israel because of their, they were strong and righteous, because they were small. He promised David that his throne would last forever, promises that God made to shepherds who had gone before. But at the same time, as Amos tells us, God's justice must be carried out. The thing is, though, that so will God's promises. Many years after Amos, Another shepherd came out of obscurity, the good shepherd, a shepherd that was promised, a shepherd that was a commitment made from the beginning. God, he fulfills his promises, 
and he promises to bless the nations. He renews and restores all that has been broken. And on that old rugged cross, Jesus was measured against the crookedness of the plumb line of all of Israel's sin, as well as ours too. And he destroyed Israel's false temples. And Jesus died for those people, just as he has died for each one of you as well, so that he could restore a right spirit within you. You know, verse 15 of Amos, we hear the Lord, and he says, but the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, go and prophesy to my people. Amos was given not an easy job, and yet it was a calling from God to stand firm in the plumb line that God had set before him. And this is a plumb line that God shows you too, that you might stand firm in him. My, you might stand firm in the knowing the promises of God are eternal. Stand firm in the grace on the foundation that God has given to you. And just as God sent former shepherds to Israel to lead them, so now a new Israel is led by the greatest shepherd. We are led by that greatest of the shepherds, which is God. And he calls you to follow the grace, stand on that grace, to stand firm on that plumb line and be reminded that God's promises are true and that you may pr stand firm even in the face of a world that doesn't stand true. And may you stand in the grace of God and may you be re reminded of the plumb line that is our Lord in heaven. Stand firm and be a light to this world. And in the name of our one true God that each of us prays and says,